about Peter. Not too quickly. Um, because I think something of the life of Peter um, can, can help us to discover that, you know, I actually think Jesus really just wants our hearts. I think he just wants to go after our hearts. Um, and I'm, I'm sharing stuff today that is actually really current for me. Um, so it's not, I've not got this particularly worked out and linear in the way I'm thinking about it, but it's just where I'm at um, on this journey of, of saying to, to Jesus, okay, what does it look like for you to rescue my heart? Um, so I hope some of what we explore in the life of Peter uh, will, will help us on that journey. I've got some slides. I don't know if they're, if they're ready. Here's one. Here's your order, sir. A thousand business cards saying Simon the Fisherman. <laughs> Later that day, Simon, from now on, you shall be known as Peter. Um, so obviously, uh, Simon had a, quite a dramatic name change. Um, just a silly uh, cartoon. Uh, but I think so often um, there can be an image of Peter. Perhaps the next slide might help. So I googled Peter, and this is what came up. Um, to be honest, I, I, that, that doesn't work for me. I don't think that's Peter at all. Here's what I think Peter looked like. Um, I, I say this because of the life of Peter. This, this, for me, encapsulates someone who's been on a journey. Someone who has been weathered by life. Someone who has learned to trust in places and situations that are beyond his control. And he's learned to live beyond his limitations. Um, and I think something of Peter comes across in that sort of face. Uh, Pete, I, I really resonate a lot with Peter, partly because when Jesus called him, so they were out on a boat, you can read this in Luke 9, um, Jesus says to Peter, take me out in your boat so I can speak to the crowd. So Peter does that and he's listening to Jesus speak. And then Jesus says, let's go fishing. And, and Simon Peter's like, well, I've been fishing all night, but if you say so, we'll do it. Uh, and, and Jesus tells him to cast a net. He catches a load of fish. And instantly, Jesus um, is in this boat with Peter, and Peter says, go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. Something in Peter, in that moment, he recognised who Jesus was. Go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. Um, and I think that gives us a glimpse at the heart of Peter. Uh, and I'm saying that now at the start because as we go through, it's really easy to look at the life of Peter and go, wow, you know, what, a, what an incredible man of God. What a, he was an unschooled fisherman. You know, Jesus didn't pick a religious elite guy. He went for a bloke who was fishing. And, and in his own admission, Peter says, I'm a sinful man. I love the life of Peter because he was incredibly impulsive. He didn't always think it through. He, he just went in. He just felt his heart go and he followed. And I like that about Peter. He was explosive, passionate. He trusted and obeyed and he, he went the full journey. It's suggested that at about age 62, uh, he was crucified for his uh, faith by Nero. Um, and here's a, here's a painting. Uh, I think it was Caravaggio. I'm not an artist, really. Have we got the next slide? Thank you. There we go. So they're lifting him up. Um, and he refused to be crucified in the same manner as Christ, so he, he went head down. Um, and, and I looked at this painting and I asked myself, what would cause a man to go that route? What would cause a man to, to, get, to go to that place? And obviously the Lord spoke over his life and he, he obviously didn't have complete choice in this matter, but... What took him to this journey? What took him on this incredible life with Jesus? And I, I think for me, Peter is one of the people in the Bible that, that was fully alive. That was fully alive. And I kind of want to explore that and, and ask you the question, what does that look like for you? What does it look like for you to be fully alive in your relationship with Jesus? Uh, the next slide, I think, is my last one. Yeah. Um, what, what happens is, when moments, I, I guess I've started to realise, when moments come along in our lives, they can often feel like mountains. I tried to pick the most nasty, awkward-looking mountains I could find for us to scale together this morning. But 
But in your life, there must have been, or there may be now, and maybe there will be to come, moments that will feel like you've suddenly just descended into this valley and around you are all these mountains. And what I've discovered is there's two things that happen in me. There's an initial response of, I'm stuck. Like, I, I can't get around these. I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go here. And then the second response is, I'm, I'm climbing these things. I'm going to find a way. It might take me a while. I might slip back. I might slip back. I might slip back. But I'm going to find a way to, a way to scale these mountains. And I think Jesus uses this stuff in our lives to rescue our hearts. So the question for me has been, what does it look like to go off grid with Jesus? Because I think he uses these mountains in our lives, these moments, to say, I want to take you off grid. I want to take you off the map that you've made. And I want to rescue your heart. And I wonder if I paused and asked you, what does your map look like? Maybe it's work and you've got that planned out, or, or children, it's holidays, your house, your health, your finances, your retirement, your pension. I don't know what stage you're in and what stage your map is in, but I think we all make those plans, we all make those maps. And I think what happens is that when these mountains arrive, Jesus says, I can use these because I want to get you off your map. I want you to come off grid with me and I want to rescue your heart. And I think for Peter, uh, we, we can see that in his journey. Um, I, I kind of had a quick look at the life of Peter. And uh, since, he, since he started following Jesus in that moment in the boat, uh, he then sees a little girl come back to life. I mean, how amazing must that have been? He walks on water, he drowns and gets saved. <laughs> I mean, that's an experience. I've not had that one. Um, and he, he had these amazing moments of such vivid clarity um, in John 6, 68, where he says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. He has these moments where he glimpses at Jesus and says, you're it. You're the one I was waiting for. I didn't even know I was waiting for you, but I found you. Because remember, this is an unschooled fisherman who felt like a real sinful bloke in the presence of Jesus. And when Jesus said, follow me, what did he do? He left his nets, he left his boat, he left his livelihood. Bible tells us he had a family. For, for Peter, those mountains must have come into view when Jesus said, are you ready for this? Will you follow me? I want your heart. It, they must have been. The, the thoughts of, well, how am I going to provide for my kids and my family? And where will this journey take me? And how long will it be? And what do I need to pack? And he left his nets, he left his boat, and he said, I'm in. Unschooled, sinful fisherman. Uh, he gets rebuked by Jesus. I mean, that's a tough one. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. I'm not sure I'd have recovered from that one. <laughs> uh, but Peter did. Um, Peter witnesses the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain, where he sees Moses and Elijah as well. Jesus speaks into his life and says, you will deny me. Peter says it will never happen. <laughs> Peter sleeps in the garden as Jesus prays. Peter acts impulsively, cutting off a servant's ear when they come and try to take Jesus away from him. After the crucifixion, G uh, Peter rushes to the tomb and Jesus appears later on to, G uh, to, to Peter alive again. Peter goes fishing and he sees Jesus and then again in a moment of just impulse he jumps in the water rolls up his garments and swims to the beach because he sees Jesus on the beach and he has breakfast with him and then Peter is reinstated by Jesus and that's what we heard tonight heard this morning in, in John 21 Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit he starts preaching sees thousands of people come to faith he leads the church he heals a guy who couldn't walk. He speaks truth over a couple and then the Lord strikes them down. Unschooled fishermen. 
Sinful bloke. He starts travelling, goes on missions with John. He's preaching the gospel everywhere. Peter is used to bring a girl back to life. Peter has his eyes open to the fullness of the gospel that is for the, for the Gentiles too. And then he gets put in prison. Then he gets rescued from prison. He writes some incredible stuff. And then he gets crucified. I mean, that, I, I looked at that list and thought, wow, that's fully alive. And I think on that journey, I think Jesus went after Peter's heart. And, and that's the point I want to make this morning that, that I think Jesus goes after our hearts um, because whilst it's not the only moment in Peter's life where he denied Christ uh, I think it's probably quite a, a pivotal point for him I think it was quite a, a landmark moment for, for Peter he'd had these three years of following Jesus and seeing so much and being part of so much and then in, in that moment he says no I, I, don't, I don't know this guy in Jesus' moment of need, the very point at which a friend stands and says, I'm with you. He says, no, I, I didn't, I don't know, Jesus, you've, mis, you've misunderstood or you've, you've confused me with somebody else. You remember that moment when he, he realises he's denied Jesus and he weeps bitterly, doesn't he? I mean, that's heartbreak. And I think what's interesting here is that Jesus reinstates him in a very particular way. And I think in the life of Peter, we can draw something out. John Eldridge talks about this. Uh, and I think it's important to say uh, that I think when Jesus goes for your heart, he will wound us in the very place that we've been wounded. I'll say it again because it's really quite challenging. But I think that when Jesus goes for your heart, he will wound us in the very place where we have already been wounded. And it might seem odd because we sing about Jesus, the lover of my soul, and we've got lots of pictures and ideas around who Jesus is. Why on earth would he wound me where I'm already hurt? And I've been on a little bit of a journey with this one. And I think in our place of woundedness, we construct a false self. We build this false self. You can read it. This isn't new thought of mine. This is stuff I've been reading. Um, and John Eldridge talks about it a lot. But we can build this false self. You know, if, if you, when you get wounded, and I know you have because we all have, you imagine a, a, a dog that's wounded. What does it do? Towel between the legs and it disappears as quick as it can. And, and I've been there. When wounds have come in, I'm up that mountain, towel between my legs, looking for somewhere to hide. And, and that's what happens to our hearts when we get hurt. When we get wounded, we go into these remote places with our hearts. And I think Jesus comes up that mountain and says, I want to rescue your heart. I want you to be fully alive. But in the case of Peter, he wounds him in the very place where he's already hurt him. Why does he do that? Because we read it, didn't we? He says, do you love me? He says, Jesus, I love you. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me? And the Bible says Peter is hurt. Why is he hurt? Because that's his wound. He denied Christ. He, he turned away from him. And Jesus hits him right where it hurts. And I think it's because the false self is something that Jesus won't let you carry. Whatever, whatever the stick is that helps you walk, I'll be honest, I think Jesus kicks it away. And he says, don't rely on that. Trust me. Let me, let me have your heart. And, and it is quite possibly one of the most challenging things to do is to surrender your heart to Jesus and let him work in the place where you carry the, the, the biggest wounds. In rescuing our hearts, I think Jesus dismantles the false self. Because what, what we do and what I've done is when you're wounded, you, you look and go, well, I'm good at this. I'm a good dad, so I'll stand behind that. Or I'm a good speaker or communicator, I'll stand behind that. Or I'm a faithful and loyal person, I'll stand behind that, and that will be who I am. But it's not who you are. It's the false self. And I think Jesus sees through that. He says, I actually want your heart. And it is painful, it's real, because he goes for the wounds. 
He takes away the security net so that we can be fully alive. And I love the moment, the last part in the, in the reading that we had. It's almost like, for me, it, it, sometimes we, I think we can lose the emotion around what's being said. It seems very like, straight and ordered. And, but I think Jesus grabbed him, threw his arms around him, and took him right back to that moment three years before where he said, Peter, will you follow me? I think he looked me in the eye and said, will you follow me again? Grabbed him. I mean, let's make it visceral, let's make it engaging. It's not just a script. It wasn't just two guys, you know, will you follow me? Yes, I will. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. It was a moment. That was a moment where Peter had his heart rescued. But Jesus did it through wound in the wound. And I know that's not, that's not a normal thing to kind of say or, or reflect on. But, but I actually think it's happening. And uh, we accept the invite to leave all that we have relied on and venture out with God. That's it. So I don't know for you uh, this morning, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for us to reflect on this. I don't know for you this morning what that wound might have been or what those wounds are. Uh, I don't know if you are um, in a place where you can say, you know what, Jesus has got my heart, uh, you know, and it's wild and I'm excited what he's doing and I'm free and if that's you this morning, praise the Lord. I know it's not quite where I'm at. Uh, I've been up that mountain for a long time, wounded and hiding, and my heart was in a remote place. But I've heard the whisper, I've heard Jesus saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on your heart. So I start coming down the mountain slowly. <laughs> but you can trust him. You can trust him. I want to read something to you um, just to, to close. A friend of mine, um, he read this song to me. It's a song by Graham Kendrick, for, for, for the joys and for the sorrows. I'll just read this to you and then, and then we'll pray. For the joys and for the sorrows, the best and worst of times, for this moment, for tomorrow, for all that lies behind, fears that crowd around me, for the failure of my plans, for the dreams of all I hope to be, the truth of what I am. For this, I have Jesus. For this, I have Jesus. For the tears that flow in secret in the broken times, for the moments of elation or the troubled mind, for all the disappointments or the sting of old regrets, all my prayers and longings that seem unanswered yet, for the weakness of my body, for the burdens of each day, for the nights of doubt and worry when sleep has fled away, needing reassurance and the will to start again, a steely-eyed endurance, the strength to fight and win. For this, I have Jesus. For this, I have Jesus. Let's pray.